All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I think we have a good number. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Lopez, and I'm the manager of film and lecture programs at the North Carolina Museum of Art. Welcome to our virtual lunchtime lecture, architects Henry Smith Miller and Lori Hawkinson in Perfect Utopia, Barbara Kruger, and the museum's park origin. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us today. This lunchtime lecture is accompanying programming for current exhibition, To Be Rather Than To See, which is on view in this building's level B Gallery 3 um, until July 17. If you haven't visited this free exhibition already, we highly encourage you to do so. It's such a great and interesting exhibition, and we hope you can visit it soon. Before we begin with the lecture, I'd like to give everyone an overview of the agenda for today. We will have three speakers for this lecture, our former NCMA Director of Planning and Special Projects, Daniel Dan Gottlieb will be our first speaker, and then we'll introduce our two highly esteemed guest speakers, Lori Hawkins and Henry Smith Miller. Uh, we will have a short Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Please enter any questions or comments using the Q&A function or the chat box. If possible, we ask that you please specify if your question or comment is for all of the panelists or uh, one of them uh, specifically. Uh, this lecture will be recorded and uploaded to the NCMA YouTube page, and I will also share the link of the recording with you via email. If you have any issues during this event, please let me know in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce the NCMA's former Director of Planning and Special Projects, Daniel Dan Gottlieb. Dan Gottlieb was the museum's chief designer, then Director of Planning, Design, and Museum Park from 1990 to 2020. During his three-decade ten tenure, he led the transformation and design of its 164-acre campus from former prison site into a cultural destination, including its amphitheater, West Building and Museum Park. Dan was drawn to the museum by the ambition and out-of-the-box ideas embedded in the site master plan that's the subject of today's program. Realizing the idea of an open museum here at the NCMA became his passion integrating art, community inclusion, environmental design, and architecture. Dan's education was in fine art, photography, furniture making, biology, and arts administration. Awards and recognition include election to the American Association of Landscape Architects, the Order of the Longleaf Pine, the Lifetime Achievement Award from NCSU's College of Design, and appointment to the Summit on Fostering Universal Ethics through Museums, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Publications include the recently published essay, Museum Transformation and the Design of Citizenship. Dan's photography currently explores the impacts of climate-induced wildfire in the West. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Maria. Um, I wanna say thank you to anyone who's taken the time out to you on this beautiful day to join us for this program that um, will revisit an almost lost story, um, a story that has been um, almost buried in the, uh, in the traumatic, not the traumatic, the exciting development of the museum over these past years. And at, towards the end of my tenure, I was very keen to bring that uh, to the fore and pair it with Belinda Doherty's uh, wonderful Art in the Environment exhibition, which runs at the same time. Next, please. This is 1983. Uh, it's a year that after years of controversy and construction delays and difficulties, a new museum finally opened on the western edge of Raleigh on what promised to be a very large tract of land um, that had some problems. It was in a decayed condition and as you'll notice, up front here in the photograph was situated directly behind a prison. This was the Polk Youth Detention Center. And as you can see on the right, this was your arrival, hello. Coming into the museum, you pass this double uh, row of barbed wire. Um, and as the museum settled a few years later, my immediate predecessors began to ask the question, what does a museum do? with such a vast landscape? What does a relatively young museum with a spectacular collection of paintings and sculpture do with what would potentially be a 164 
acres. It was uh, fortunate enough to secure a uh, major uh, national endowment for the arts grant and launched a um, national competition uh, for a design team to help the museum think about master planning the site. What should happen? What should an art museum do in the next uh, decades and the next, indeed the next century? And so it had an open call which attracted uh, amazing talent from across the country. Um, next please. The selected team, each team uh, was required to have an artist working with design professionals and uh, the selected team against the most amazing uh, competition that I've had the privilege of seeing all the finalists um, was this team of Barbara Kruger, Henry Smith Miller and Laurie Hawkinson with Nicholas Cornell. And over the next uh, couple of years in 88 and 89, they worked with the museum and dove deeply into the site conditions and developed this, sometimes it's called an anti-master master plan. And you'll see why it's called that in a moment. Lori, in, um, in an interview with um, a writer for Andy Warhol's preview magazine said of this of museums, there's all this pomp and circumstance and ceremony about just getting in the front door. Basically, what we were doing is throwing the museum outdoors. And what they created is a framework to engage a more diverse public. Now, again, this is 1989. Uh, it is no secret that museums uh, were rather cloistered in the audience that they attracted. It's a very small demographic. And so this is a big idea to become much more part of the community in an inclusive way. The team dispensed with the rigidity of a master plan that dictates a place for everything and everything in its place. And instead, it set forth this framework for an ever shifting set of parameters and organic growth, which is precisely what happened in the intervening years. Next, please. So the, um, the mirror to the site plan, the physical site plan was what I regard as this poetic masterpiece um, uh, primarily by Barbara Kruger, but working with the team in this amazing collaboration. That was the theory and the program. And this is uh, a work of art that was installed in 1989 to unveil the plan to the general public after uh, the past year's work. Well, that exhibition never opened, and I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a moment. But if you just look at the poetry of this and the deep meaning of the theory in the program, I'll just read a couple of them. To disperse the univocality of a master plan into an aerosol of imaginary conversation and inclusionary tactics. It sounds like very much like 1980s art speak, but think about it for a moment. This is a museum in the 1980s that were thinking about inclusionary tactics for developing a site into this unknown territory to construct a cycle of repair and discovery, a deep recognition of the existing condition of this site as a damaged site, both culturally and physically, and to begin a cycle uh, embedded with this organic planning uh, to restore and rejuvenate it as a bridge to the community, to the museum, and to, and to have no end in sight. Now that's a particularly poignant one because uh, with this exhibition, we unveil a new master plan, and it will have truly no end in sight. So this was an open framework for this organic uh, occupation of, a, of this land by the museum in these zones that the team put forth um, in a way that reflected contemporary time uh, and tastes, uh, both curatorially and in terms of community engagement. It established a philosophy for the museum that was not a gallery in the open air, but rather an ever-changing landscape. Next, please. When I arrived at the museum, uh, to my chagrin, I learned that the plan in terms of support uh, from the administration and others, it was fairly moribund. And so working along with another curator, uh, we worked to um, um, 
get the project going and to get a first phase implemented that could work as, as we say, a hinge to the landscape. And what we focused on was an amphitheater, a place for performing arts. So we re-engaged the original design team to create the textualized landscape, or as we all know it, the Museum Park Theater or Amphitheater, which was completed in 1997. Next, please. Now, in this year, celebrating its 25th anniversary of 25 years of fantastic programming, mostly led by the curatorial genius of George Holt and now Moses Green. And this has become just an amazing uh, connector to the community and bringing uh, the performing arts into the fabric of the kind of programs that the museum puts forth. Uh, next, please. And in, in the intervening years, the park has become activated with programs, with art principally curated by Linda Doherty and recreational trails. And you can see the, the wide variety of kind of activities uh, that are familiar pleasures uh, to the public, yet without sacrificing quality in terms of art and design. Next, please. And they take all different shapes and forms, even including 25 foot tall bunnies. Next, please. I just wanted to show this slide very briefly um, to show that the idea of um, embodying uh, the concept, the DNA of the plan, which is um, taking this fabulous collection of mostly paintings and drawings and, and sculpture at that time, and bridging it to a wider view of what a museum can be through various zones of engagement from formal through programmatic to the informal in what the original plan called the preserve. Next please. To be rather than to seem um, is an exhibition as Maria noted that's up now. And um, I can't tell you how happy I have been to been to be afforded the uh, the chance to tell this story, and I want to thank Valerie Hillings for that opportunity and for today to bring this history to life and to bring it full circle with this ongoing no end in sight with unveiling uh, the next master plan for the environment. Next, please. Here is the opening of the exhibition, and I work with Barbara Kruger and Henry and Lori. Uh, helped with this as well, and we reinstalled the original work of art of Barbara's uh, with the theory in the program, which introduces uh, the exhibition. Next, please. Here's the inside of the exhibition, and I was so thrilled to be able to reassemble for the first time since 1996, Henry and Lori uh, rediscovered these panels that were installed in the 1996 Venice Biennale. This, this plan was widely published and admired around the world. And so we reassembled them for the first time in this exhibition. Next, please. The exhibition then focuses on how the museum itself has become an environmentalist, acting in a way that is, uh, as a good citizen, embracing uh, high standards for both design and for environmental stewardship of this 164 acres. Next, please. Culminating in the unveiling of the new master plan designed by Philadelphia-based landscape architecture firm Andre Pogon. And here I'd like also to thank Rachel Woods for so beautifully shepherding this plan uh, to completion. Next, please. So uh, that is a, um, I hope it was brief introduction. And uh, now I have uh, the honor to introduce my old friends, um, Henry and Lori. Smith Miller and Hawkinson Architects is a New York City based architecture firm uh, and urban design studio that was founded in 1983. Lori Hawkinson is a multidisciplinary architect whose experience includes exhibition design and curation and theater design. She's a professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, and currently serves on the New York City Public Design Commission. 
Henry Smith Miller was associated with the architectural firm of Richard Meyer before founding his own firm in 1977. He is a professor in the graduate program at Pratt Institute. Their practice believes that architecture as a force for transformation, for transformation where it engages in dialogue with contemporary culture through a negotiation of traditional craft and vanguard technique. Across the United States and abroad, Smith, Miller, and Hawkinson has designed public spaces and private projects, including museums, parks, government facilities, transportation terminals, and performing arts. Their work includes the Corning Museum of Glass, the Wall Street Ferry Terminal, and of course, NCMA's renowned site plan and amphitheater. And now it's my pleasure to turn the baton over to you, Henry and Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So I guess we'll go to the next slide. Um, and there we go. Well, I thought I'd say something because this is a picture that we took before we entered the competition, before we got together to have any ideas, and before we did anything. And as you can see, we drove up in a rental car, and I was in the passenger side. And we noticed that this was a landscape that didn't have any topsoil and no trees. Uh, but we thought it was kind of interesting, um, which got us started. Uh, so next. This is another picture. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to start this talk uh, in a negative format, but it was pretty clear that we were really not invited to, to walk around the museum, probably to go in. And exactly these kinds of signs pointed us to the fact that there was this amazing asset, which is as huge as, as Dan points out, huge number of, of acreage. So Laurie and I got started with, uh, with um, Barbara, and I think she'll talk about the development and the transformation of our thinking about the project. Next. So when we went down to North Carolina, as Henry said, we, went, we went to the bookstore, Dan knows the name of it, downtown. Um, we were looking, you know, we loved going there. We went to Barbara and Nicholas. We were, you know, investigating the whole area. We wanted to find as much about the history of the area. We wanted to find, we, were, we got very fixated on trying to find this idea of the earliest drawing of the site. What did this site or photo, what did this site look like? We had a number of historical aerial photographs, but we wanted to know what the site looked like in its earlier in in instances. And we came across this drawing by Governor John White, 1585. Um, it's actually Roatan, it's the town of Secaton, and it's nearby. And what this light bulb went off in our heads because we realized, and maybe this seems obvious, but you know that there wasn't really an original landscape. Obviously there are people there before, people were working the land, the land was in process, continually in process, and will continually be in process, and that it's a very open-ended situation, right? And so in this drawing, which talks about time, it talks about corn being celebrated, planted, harvested all at once, you know, became a real inspiration for how we thought about this large site. Next. So an early sketch that we made, and Henry's gonna talk about this, but some of the things to note here, and um, we were working around this area table that we are sitting at right now in, in a different manifestation, but um, you know, there are things that are said here, such as you know, indigenous uh, history, things like a planted land, time lapse, you know, there's a picture of one of the markers there that's drawn in plan that we ended up using. We're, we're attaching a screen to the site. You want to say yeah, well, this is, yeah, well, I find it this. I find it kind of ironic that there's this messy uh, vitality, nothing but words, and a couple of drawings, and there's no real identifiable form other than the plaque. Uh, Laurie points out that the, if you look really carefully, this is kind of like the what's it called, the, some sort of mysterious document that has all its implications. There is a little diagram on the upper right, which is actually the amphitheater. So in our discussion, <coughs> we, we actually made a kind of record. And, and what, what's interesting for me is this starts uh, with a drawing and it transforms itself to uh, a digital uh, exercise 
And now it's transformed itself to a regional park. So um, anyway, let's go to the next slide. So, that, I mean, that's really the way we think. And if you go next, so we're all thinking, and it was a way we could all think together was over this piece of paper that was really the plan. This is then a drawing, a very careful drawing we make, because we make very careful drawings, showing all the topographic lines on the site of the 164 acres. Um, you're seeing the paths, you're seeing the museum up there and that area in the upper left. But it's really talking about on the right, a kind of phased operation that would happen. And we thought maybe over 10 years, which is kind of ironic because here we are now 25 years and we're talking and Dan's talking about this preserve area, which is one of the areas we mentioned. If you go to the next slide um, in this plan. So we, really the project was together a kind of a script, which is here indicated as a kind of phased plan and also that theory and program text which Dan refers to as the artwork, which was really this collaboration of, you know, ideas about what could be there. Next. Uh, the next drawing shows the plan, right? So the plan, it doesn't look like a formal plan. It has a number of zones and you can see the zones are something like seven zones, eight zones. Um, but the zones are, are just identified really in terms of um, space and time and program and occupation. So we have an active culture zone, and we have kind of passive culture, maybe happening a little further away. We have a pinedum, an area that is where we're trying to restore a pine forest. So, you know, very, very conscious and careful about the landscape and how we might preserve it and, and really um, allow it to not just return, but thrive both with um, passive and active um, programs, art, um, performances in the landscape. Oh, I just want to point out that that the come go back one. Can we go back one. Basically, there's if you look in the lower right hand corner, instead of saying something like uh, figurative art or sculpture, uh, our zones are uh, have this weird environmental conservation zone. Now, this is 25 years ago, so in a way, this this project was a harbinger of current thinking. And it's segued it, 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 10-year plan. Now it's a 25-year plan, and there's an evolution that's going to happen in the next 50 or 100 years. So thanks to the vision of, of the people who established the competition and thought about developing the property, it's happening. Okay, so well, that's, yeah, know, so okay. the um and then if then in the next slide it shows this is kind of a crazy drawing that is really showing all of these zones separately. But, but this drawing is very intentional in that it's meant to show that the plan and this strategy over the 164 acres is not a formal plan, like the plan of Paris, you know, where you have this symmetrical, the Champs-Élysées, which does, divides into this symmetrical plan and highlighting certain monuments. This is a plan that is formed by adjacencies, by ecological conditions, by programmatic conditions, by topography. And that's how these little cutouts are all, uh, really that's what's making them. So it's not that we understand their edges, it's we understand them in terms of space and time and program. Next. So this is another way in which we communicate it because I wanna talk about process here because we're all, as Barbara used to say, we're putting different hats on, like she would put, we would put the artist hat on, she would put the architect hat on, we were really, trading ideas very freely and we weren't really, we all trust each other a great deal. We did not feel as if we were stepping on each other's toes. Here's Barbara sending us a fax um, about the letter P. This was an initial idea. This is 1993 in the upper left-hand corner. I still have this, I found it in our files. Um, and it's a number of words that start with the letter P. She was first thinking of maybe using words on there instead of what we ended up with with the phrases that say, please, please me and what have you. So. So these, this was kind of prayer, prejudice, um, painkiller, pie. This is kind of funny. So, so um, this was initial thoughts on that. Next. Um, and then this other, this next drawing shows, um, and you know, because maybe you've been there or you will go there, is the letters and how they eventually end up being described because they're made up of different materials and of, of more content, um, historical content, um, information about people who are from North Carolina, writers, um, things they've written that you can discover as you move through this, you know, one, one and a half acre space. 
So that, in other words, the letter C is made of sand. You can sit on it and like you're at the beach and watch a film, uh, things like that. Next. Um, and then this early model in the next slide is the corrugated cardboard. So, you know, we were doing something that was pretty difficult, actually, um, technically. We were taking these letters that are something like 80 feet long, and we are setting them, Helvetica extra bold italic, we're setting it into a topographic condition. So that's a really complicated computational problem. Uh, you know, we did it here with a, with a model, but then to draw that, you know, we had to rely on, you know, new tools that we were using in architecture. Uh, next. Um, this next, draw, next model, we've made a lot of study models, is a study model of the amphitheater. It shows a very different kind of structure than the one we ended up using with Guy. Uh, the roof was designed and we faced it in this direction, specifically the, the direction of the performance uh, and the direction of where the people sit so that we wouldn't really be blasting the neighbors, could it, but when you drive up and look also that you're kind of seeing the performance as you enter in from that turnaround. Next. Uh, as you know, the letter P with the words, please, please don't let history repeat itself. Please, please me, please don't, that's fire with fire. So these were, um, you know, obviously some of these additional phrases that, and texts that were embedded into the, the large text to picture this next. And people were invited to obviously participate and, and engage with all of this. This is one of those technical drawings just kind of for fun where you can see you know, how we, how we had to describe this for our construction documents. It was pretty interesting. Uh, the contractors thought we were a little crazy. Next. Uh, more images, you can keep going through these. Um, and, and it's really, you know, this is the detail from those plaques, those historical plaques, which were which we saw around, driving around the state doing research, and then we wanted to bring in a, in a kind of smaller scale into the site, onto the letter I, which, which identifies the state and identifies where some of these um, events happened, where people were, where they were from, just to kind of identify for people as they come there, all these great things that happened here in North Carolina. Next. Um, additionally, you know, here you see obviously the, the letter I and the kind of locations back to their, where they are in the state on that letter. Uh, and the next image, which shows, you know, people engaging with that of all ages, running around on that. Next, these are, these are some of the photographs from when it was initially opened, um, which is, you know, great to, great to see. You next. know, yeah, for me, it's really amazing that these, these signs, which are on the side of the highways, that point to some other location, right? Because they're never really where it happened. Barbara had the idea to bring the signs and then Dan got them made at half scale and they're put on this, the letter I, which is the I that, that's, that actually has a motto in it. And this one has the map of North Carolina. So basically we brought the, brought the entire history of the state as described in these signs to the museum so that people could learn. And, um, you know, that's amazing because when you go to a museum, it's a learning experience. But in this case, we were celebrating uh, the state and the history, not only the history of the state itself, but going back to the indigenous people and the evolution of landscape. So uh, it was, it's a big thought here. And what Dan's done recently with an integrating the the, the, this museum grounds with other parks is bringing the whole idea to the region, which is exceptional. I don't know anywhere, anybody else has done that. Yes. And then of course the, um, uh, the John Maynard Keyes quote, you know, in, in, in the long run world dead. So, you know, these number of texts, which, you know, Barbara pulled together in places on the letter E um, throughout the site um, and throughout this uh, texturized landscape piece, to be able to bring different scales and different voices to this space as you discover it. Because as we said, there's both active culture, which is you know, a very formal performance, a film screening, or passive culture where you're just going there to picnic, school groups come. Um, you know, we wanted to make places where people could run around and just discover things you know, in this space that is adjacent to the museum and then hopefully again, further away as, you, as one moves through the larger site. 
Um, the next slide shows um, a slide from construction, which we love, which is the screen we designed with uh, Dean Norton's instructional engineer. Um, it looks like it's undesigned, this truss at the back, but it's actually very specifically designed to connect into the floors where the structure was specifically so that we could cantilever this very large screen off of the building. Um, we had worked with the with Doug in the, in the museum, Doug's last name, Dan, is Campion, Champion, Doug Campion, Champion, right? Champion, yeah. And, yeah, so he had this great film program going, and we said, why don't you bring it to the outside? He was having a truck. He would put a, like, almost like a sheet out, out on the outside of the building. And then we said, let's just make it a formal part of the museum. So we spent a lot of time interviewing and, you know, the, the people in the museum and what they did and the different programs to be able to fold that out into the landscape and make it and open it up in a sense. Next. Um, I think the next slide shows that it's more finished state um, when it was first opened with the uh, amphitheater roof, the stage, we're protecting what happens underneath it, the, the, um, the screening booth, which um, you know has the projector in it, like a kind of a character in a play. So all these pieces, it's like a you know a theater or a cinema that its pieces are kind of exploded out um, to be revealed to you as individual parts in the landscape. And then um, next, finally, there's a view from I think one of the final opening events. This is just showing the screen, obviously, in the landscape. Um, we envision, and I know Dan says that you guys do this, that you could have something happening on the screen and also something happening, you know, a, a performance happening under the stage. So these could, two things could happen simultaneously. And then uh, next, at, um, at an opening, at the, um, when, it, when it did open, in which there were fireworks and all kinds of things kind of occupying this space. But that, you know, those letters are kind of seen in the oblique when you stand on that overlook um, position, but then as you move down into it, you're discovering these other texts and, and other histories and other materials and surfaces that you can engage with. Um, and then finally, uh, we wanted to share the video that we made, which was, uh, which was made for the Museum of, the Con of Contemporary Art of an exhibit they did there. Elizabeth Smith curated and traveled, I think, to the Berkeley Museum of this project um, in which we used our AutoCAD files and created um, an animation, a very early animation of the whole project. Well, I mentioned the uh, evolution from a, a, a group sketch to a fat, typewritten fax document to a whole lot of words to a lot of discovery and a tremendous amount of collaboration. This was a, a prehistoric uh, <laughs> 3D drawing, and I apologize for the jerkiness. But the file is of such a size that it really doesn't uh, project very smoothly. I want to point out the secret of this drawing because every single component is translucent. You can see through it. And um, this is the kind of way that architects think about buildings and projects. Or uh, most people think about them as, you know, solid. But you can actually see in through the letters, you can see through the buildings. And um, it's a, kind of like a, a vision rather than an actual uh, description of something that's real. We were thrilled that we were able to do this. And actually, we were even more thrilled when we were able to build it. And we're even more thrilled to know that it's still operating. And we're even more <laughs> thrilled to know that it's going to be restored. And finally, we're thrilled to be here talking to you all about it. Because well, it just seems like yesterday, and it really points out it's been 25 years. I don't know, is there any, any questions? We I can mean, we also, play. just to say that we're, so you're seeing the film within the film on the screen. And yeah. another reason that the, the, the surfaces are transparent is we didn't have to model as much because it's taking a tremendous amount of memory as it is. And, you know, at that time there weren't, you know, CPUs that could like hold all this information. So the whole thing was kind of this huge uh, elephant that we're wrestling to the ground in this animation. But um, I think it does show in the, in the exhibition and it runs very smoothly. So you can see it there. Maybe you're seeing it differently than you are. So the ground is shown as a kind of topographic web also to save um, bits, you know, in the model. So here you're kind of flying through some of these surfaces, but, you know, it was a way to describe something in time and space, which is how we thought about the project and not 
as a fixed entity, as an object. And obviously the art and ways in which the public engage with this space was meant to be that as also it was meant to be temporal when we say there's no end in sight to make it permanent temporary. I mean, all those ideas, um, you know, we were thinking about and, and thinking about art in the landscape in a very different way than for instance, Storm King, which was probably one of the only other models um, at the time, which were, Barbara always said, like a piece of parsley on the plate. You know, they're just, they're, you know, beautiful sculptures like your Henry Moore that was sitting there when we arrived, but that we thought that the art could have maybe a different relationship um, to the landscape and to the people that engage with it here. Right here, we take you into the projection booth and <laughs> into the film that's in the film that's really in the film. Right. So uh, the iterative uh, nature of our process goes on. It ends, this film ends with a little bit of a somber moment uh, because you have to have the end of the film, although we wanted the film to go on forever. So the, the, the camera approaches the letter This is e. funny because you go through the boulders, which yeah. is kind of crazy, through the boulders, which are the letter S. And so the letter E is a concrete block bunker, and it has uh, these concrete plaques and what I like is who's being quoted and what's being said. And by the way, we scripted this uh, film to end with this remark. Yes. Is our degradation necessary to your elevation? Must our hands be tied in order that you might try? Like Frederick Douglass. Yeah. So anyway, thank you and thank you for having us. And I guess we want to, Dan, see if there are questions or if you had other thoughts to bring to all of this yes thank you that was that was fantastic i thought that was and it brought back a lot of memories and some trauma but a lot of memories <laughs> i would like to go back to the beginning a little bit uh, to talk about coming out of the 1980s and into our project that the idea of collaboration that the idea of artists working with architects and the emerging new public art movement was really uh, hot in the air, mm -hmm. was really a subject of lots of con uh, conversation and, uh, um, and a lot of good projects, but ours was unique um, by bringing it to a different level. Um, it certainly is evident in, um, not only in the master plan, but uh, in, uh, in, as a realized project with the amphitheater. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, taking off the beret or the T-square or the, the great terms that you guys use to talk about collaboration without ego? Well, you know, I think trust is really the key word there. And that's why we were, you know, we had, um, and worked with Nicholas and Barbara. We had been involved, each of us actually separately, but while we had the firm and a project um, that happened in lower Manhattan here called Art on the Beach, where artists and architects were asked to collaborate. So it was kind of in the air, I think. And Patty Fuller and your, your museum really took this up and took it you know, extremely seriously and made this, I don't know, it was an international competition, you know, open call to put teams together and um, to think about this very large piece of land that was adjacent to the museum. So it's pretty unique, I mean, it's extremely unique. I can't think of other examples, but I think that, um, and I think people may have thought Barbara was an odd selection for an artist. Like, why didn't you pick somebody who, you know, works in landscape or works in land art? Mm -hmm. um, and really we were, uh, you know, she's somebody that is extremely knowledgeable about architecture. She was writing about art. She's kind of a cultural critic. You know, I mean, I knew her well and we were, and Nicholas who was, you know, firm that works, um, he's actually trained as an architect and a landscape architect. And, you know, their work is extremely sensitive to, um, you know, issues of resiliency and, you know, existing conditions. And so we, we tried to kind of think about, you know, all of that together in this team. And I think that the idea of trading hats was that we just weren't really confined to who we were um, in our discrete roles. I come from a background, I have a master's in fine arts. I came, you know, through art into architecture. I think that we all feel pretty comfortable in just kind of stepping on each other's toes and moving into each other's territory. 
in how we thought about this. And so, you know, of course, Barbara came up with those words, picture this, and we're we at different words that we we're putting together, but then we had to place it in the land when we came up with um, those phrases of the program and the theory, that was something that we all worked on together. They were ideas that were all part of the conversation we were having and that you, you know, saw little tidbits of it in that sketch. So, you know, it's, I, I think that trust is probably the, the most important word one thinks about here because uh, we're sitting in front of a project we're working on right now with Olakan Jaifis for a building in Brooklyn. Uh, he's an artist in the, in the, um, percent for our program for the city of New York. Um, he's doing huge pictures of animals over our building. Um, so, I mean, it's something that we're familiar with working on um, together with artists. And I think that, um, you know, trying to have, I'm gonna use the word traditional, but less, less of an idea that art is something that just embellishes something or sits there as an objet, like that Barbara had, we had written on that sketch, we had, we had said, objects versus people. That was something that was very important, not thinking just about objects, but thinking about people. Um, and so imagining and, uh, and, and trying to anticipate engagement, right? That was what's really important about working on outside in that site and that we could, um, and that we tried to work, you know, as much as we said, in each, of, each other's territory as possible. Well, I don't know, there was a last slide that we didn't show, is it there? Can you put it up? It's a picture of us on the roof on Canal Street. I don't know whether it's there. Maybe you edited it out. No, no. Maria, is it still there? Yeah, I yeah, think so I, I, I want to put it up because it's 25 years ago. And it was a shock. We found it actually in the bottom of the drawer. And it's the team um, uh, on the roof in New York. And I have to tell you that if I were on the board of trustees of the North Carolina State Museum. And I looked at that group of people, I would never have a, allowed them to do anything. Uh, and I would like to put a picture up because I think that, oh, later, okay. I'm, I'm, just, oh, I'm, I'm putting it up. I think it's just, if you really think about it, I mean, I don't know what the public that's watching this thinks about this, questions. but, and we would like questions actually. Uh, there's some, uh, yeah, there. So can you imagine that such beauty came out of such a rough situation? We're, <laughs> the photographer is actually on the edge of the roof because he or she, we don't know who took the picture, is, is wanting to capture the view all the way to California across the mm -hmm. Hudson River. And then I don't have any hair anymore. And Barbara always kept hers, and Nicholas is looking the other way, and then Lori, at least she's looking at the camera. So I, you know. I, I think it's just this kind of gritty situation here on Canal Street where our office is, and, and we're still here. We're yeah. still here. The same but, but, but yeah. Henry, I have bad for, news for you. This was 33 years ago, not 25. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but I think I, so, uh, I, I do want to say that this is uh, uh, an image that I love. It's on top of 305 Canal Street, which is where Henry and Lori are sitting today and uh, my home away from home during this whole time um, with Canal Street uh, uh, below. This was this appeared in Andy Warhol's preview magazine. Interview, interview. In, yes. It's called Interview it's, Magazine. This is a interview, that's right, correct. Um, but that is indicative of the kind of traction that this plan had uh, in publications. I first learned about it when it was published in Assemblage Magazine coming out of MIT. It was published in Casa Bella and it was hot stuff. Um, why was it hot stuff? Uh, because it was breaking a lot of rules. It was crossing a lot of boundaries. It was coloring out of the lines. And um, I, have to, I have to ask you this. Um, when I began to investigate models, where are models out there for this? Uh, what could we learn from out there in the world, in the US, in Europe, uh, even in Japan? Um, I visited lots of sites and I did not find a model. I found bits of this and I found bits of that. Um, the closest I found was a Corolla Mueller 
in the Netherlands. And that was only close because of the planning model where there was an excellent collection, a formal garden, and then these woods where artists would make things in the woods. But there was nothing that I could find in my research. There's hmm? one reference, one. which is, I mean, because I was going through some old slides and I found, I think, a presentation we made to the museum where we were trying to give examples. And Mary Beebe at um, UCSD had uh, assembled, uh, I know she was a colleague of, of Patricia Fuller's, and um, she'd assembled and, and instigated an art program on the campus of UCSD that's still ongoing today. That's it, right. It's set up in a way that you kind of discover, some things are very large, but some things are just discoverable. And that was one of the references we gave. It's quite totally different context. But, yeah, um, but nobody put a text into the ground. <laughs> Nobody put uh, letters that were 80 feet high that you couldn't see when you were standing on them. No, I, you know, the amazing thing for me is that the team had these ideas and that the museum endorsed them and Dan came along and kept the building going and the program. Mm -hmm. And what I think is even more amazing is that the new plan, I said it before, has taken this idea out into the region. So if you think about the role that art plays in, in our culture and our history, or history plays in art, this thing, is, and by the way, we know people who have borrowed this idea all over the United States. So I think it's really, I thought it was really interesting. Dan came up and we were talking about this and he showed us how the Greenway, I mean, we have one in New York where we're completing all these bike paths. You know, every time we do a project in New York, a piece of the green, Greenway, if it's near the Greenway, gets completed with the project, if you're around the edge of Manhattan, what have you. But your Greenway goes right through this park, which was really exciting to me to learn that um, it kind of becomes part of, you know, a linkage to a number of different spaces and places, you know, that one can travel through on a bike. After, right? after the amphitheater was built, um, we had an opportunity uh, to extend the Greenway and the then director, Larry Wheeler, and I then worked with the Department of Transportation and made the decision to um, uh, uh, invite investment into this 750 foot pedestrian bridge. So the Imperfect Utopia plan was, um, it was a circuit. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity to break the circuit open uh, to uh, uh, a college district and eventually to downtown. Uh, taking the idea beyond the highways. And so uh, it, was, it was incredibly uh, transformative. Uh, there is a question from uh, Darcy Foreman, actually a friend of mine on the West Coast. And she asks, how did the landscape architect fit into the process? He was with us all the time. I mean, we were working in the ground. We, you know, so we, at the same time that we say we're stepping on each other's toes, you know, there's expertise. <laughs> And um, Nicholas and his firm had tremendous expertise in well, this in sensitivity about landscape and also particularly in this project, thinking about how what was there could be encouraged to continue in that kind of larger outer space and that how we would bring um, plantings and different surfaces and materials and vegetation to the area that's more active culture um, and passive culture near the, near the... What you don't know is that Nicholas was the first land, the landscape architect for the, a project called Woodstock that didn't happen. In other words, he got the commission because he's tied to the arts and music. He got the commission to do the first Woodstock. But he didn't plan for that, Woodstock. No, no he, he got canceled and he, he, he didn't do the second one. That's the first one. The other one is if you look at the park, there is actually um, a conch like, there's a, a curve, of, it's called the Fibonacci curve, that runs around the perimeter and accommodates handicapped people in a wheel wheelchair. But you never notice that it's wheelchair, uh, wheelchair specific. There are, there are all kinds of embedded wonderful inventions. The other one is the shrimp. There's a stepped ramp that brings you down. And the way that integrates into the landscape is part of Nicholas's art. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of easy quality about how all of this slips around one another 
in this, which was originally a kind of hollow that we discovered already. We didn't excavate it. And Dan pointed out earlier that we took the stuff that we excavated, right? And we made a mound out of it. So in a way, we were actually reusing the very earth of the place, sculpting it again. Uh-oh, that sounds like art. But really, there was a lot of craft and care. Well, so it's the only irony happened because there's been this issue of interrupted uh, presentations. On the day that this was supposed to open, a hurricane showed up and, and destroyed this, this whole site. All the trees fell over. It rained. Yeah, it did. I would have, we were there. But you know what? It survived. It came back. The trees were replanted. It's now fully grown and it's expanded to the region. So there's a resiliency embedded in the thinking and then the people who put it together. And I have to go back to the vision of, of your, muse, your ex museum, Dan, to be able to support and endorse such a, such a, a progressive and innovative a program. We don't find that usually. And you pointed out there were. It's but hard think, being a pioneer. I think also uh, embedded in the that theory in the program, just for the person who has a question, is that Darcy, that there are, you know, many of those phrases actually have to do with landscape, probably as you as you read them, you know, that they have to do about forest and about kind of a secessionist idea. Understand that there's not a kind of um, you know, precise landscape that we then, you know, clip and keep fixed in time, but that we embrace the fact that it's a kind of constantly evolving. And Nicholas is really so responsible for that in our team and helping us understand that, I think it was really critical. One more note about that, Henry, you mentioned uh, the creation of that mound from the excavation in the amphitheater. There was a, a very poetic part to that too. Um, there was no park then. There was this new amphitheater that was being built and beyond it, um, it was still just the remnants of the prison site and those fields. And there was a mound built from the excavation of the amphitheater whose intention was, um, I'm not sure who exactly coined this, but as a lookout mound. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, this is where you can look out and see where the park will be. This is uh -huh. where you can see the future. Right. And the poignant piece for me of that is that uh, that was 1996 and seven. So here we are 25 years later. We're so happy to have you back uh, to reconnect with where the park is now. It does have no end in sight, mm -hmm. as you say, in terms of its development and its connections, both to art, uh, architecture, design of all kinds. And of course, uh, the collection and uh, most importantly, probably our community. So I want to thank you for your time. It's been it's been so great reconnecting uh, around this subject. Uh, I appreciate your time. It's been a lot of fun these past months uh, talking about this and digging up our our artifacts. Um, and I want to thank the museum. I want to thank Valerie uh, for allowing this to move on and to tell this story. So. Uh, thank you very much. And Maria, if you have any closing logistics, uh, this probably is the time. Yes, thank you everyone for being a uh, part of this uh, fantastic lecture. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Henry, for this very fascinating look into the museum park and the amphitheater. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And Hope that you can come to the museum and visit the exhibition to be rather than to seem um, and see some of these uh, items for yourself and learn a little bit more. Um, thank you all very much and I hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>